afternoon, everyone. NEC introduced our activities related to open source by four employees. At the end of this session, we do not set the time for Q&A. If you have a question, please catch the speaker and discuss your question later. And uh, this session is uh, provide uh, uh, omnibus uh, mini session, not, uh, not panel discussion. As a first topic, I would like to talk to you about data science in technology management as an OSPO. My name is Shino Iwami, and I work to analyze data about open source. <laughs> NEC is preparing for wireless analysis in the company. These analysis are uh, used for identifying open source to invent on development and incorporate, incorporate into our business. Seeing the volume of open source from GitHub, 20 million, in the other words, 2,000 in Japanese or more repositories per year have increased during COVID-19. It includes non-IT repositories from peaceful graduation messages to political demonstrations. Therefore, our analysis are useful to filter enormous number of OSS. However, uh, sorry. However, there is a common issue across analysis. That is, there are different ways of OSS categorization, even in one company. We are confused, uh, we are confused uh, about which one is the best. Especially, it is difficult to categorize, categorize a large number of OSS. Namely, we want to explainable categories and uh, automated updates. As a reference, uh, CNS, CNCF, uh, the Japanese OSS promotion forum, and others are providing uh, OSS categories and maps. Two, uh, I introduce our challenges about OSS classification and uh, categorization. The first methodology is clustering for OSS class classification. The methodology uses co-occurrent keyword networks. In the networks, a keyword such as GitHub tag is defined as a node, and the keywords are connected uh, if they are in the same repository. After clustering the networks, it was ex expected that the clusters will indicate OSS categories. This is an example of the result. The top 12 clusters are colored and the top frequent keywords for each cluster are extracted. Although some, some are well-known OSS categories, we identified some inclu uh, inter interesting categories. For example, uh, the green third uh, cluster is about the video and the media. Uh, on the figure, the cluster is very dense and uh, it means that uh, keywords are deeply related. Observing each period, Linux is keeping almost the top. Currently, testing tool beca becomes important as shown in the first position. The conclusions of this method methodology are, this method methodology is beneficial to discover unconscious fields of OSS. However, for the purpose of OSS categorization, this is not enough because some clusters have mixed term, themes. Uh, 
Jesus, at the next step, we are trying BERT, uh, marriage categorization. Although this is a work in progress, the techniques such as data augmentation have achieved 0 0.98 validation accuracy for uh, appro approximately 400 well-known OSS. In the future, uh, I desire that this methodology will be widely published as everyone can use it. That's all from, from me. And the next speaker is uh, Akihiro Motokuhi. <laughs> Hi, hi everyone. Um, in this small talk, uh, I will talk about why uh, we contribute to upstream development and recent activities in OpenStack. Um, this, uh, the first half is uh, not specific to OpenStack topics, but uh, uh, Kubernetes contribution will be covered by the uh, by next two speakers, so I will mainly uh, talk about uh, open stack topics uh, in the second part. Yeah, um, I'm Akihiro Motoki from NSC. I work on open stack upstream development uh, for almost 10 years. And I am serving as a core reviewer in several open stack projects like uh, Neutron, uh, Horizon, and CLI. In addition, the currently, I'm leading the OSS open source upstream development team in NSC. My team is the current uh, mainly target on contribution to infrastructure related open source project uh, like uh, Kubernetes, OpenStack, and uh, several CNSF projects. Uh, so the, uh, I talk about the OpenStack and Kubernetes contributions. Uh, so the, this is our recent activities, contribution stats. Uh, we contribute to both these softwares uh, actively and uh, we are a top 10 contributor in worldwide uh, in recent releases. Uh, OpenStack is uh, fourth, uh, uh, fifth and uh, Kubernetes also the ninth in the latest releases. So the question is, uh, why we contribute to upstream development. So, so the, as you may know, the branding is one of the reasons. Uh, contribution ranking is uh, easy to understand and uh, customers uh, check who are active in the community to know the, uh, who is a key player uh, in these softwares. So uh, this is uh, uh, one motivation to contribute. But uh, this is not the only reason. The, there are more uh, important motivations. So the, uh, one is to implement required features in the community directories. The, we also would like to fix uh, important bugs um, and hopefully backport, backport them <laughs> uh, to the released version. So the, uh, this, this kind of uh, needs are uh, usually based on the feedbacks from uh, uh, project using OpenStack or Kubernetes and also from support team. So the, we can ask it to distribute us to implement uh, the requirement, but uh, it usually takes time because they have multiple uh, customers and they need to prioritize uh, various requests from various companies. So that if we have a good connection and, uh, in the community, um, it will be uh, much faster and smooth because uh, we can uh, implement such things uh, directly. Once changes are merged in the upstream, uh, distributors usually tend to uh, provide them easily. Uh, the, for example, our Red Hat distributions, uh, for example, in the Red Hat based distributions, their uh, basic policy is a corresponding feature is included, uh, implemented in the upstream. 
Another motivation to contribute is avoid local patches. Um, we can implement features uh, as local, local patches, but if we have local patches, uh, we need to update them for every upgrade. So that if the community accept uh, these patches, uh, the, the maintenance cost would be our maintenance cost would be reduced up. That's a motivation to contribute. So, but to make these changes effect, uh, efficiently, so the, I think, the, I believe, being a key members in the community is uh, important. Uh, is important. So, uh, Position names are different uh, depending on co communities. So that in case of uh, OpenStack, uh, these are uh, called uh, technical committee and the uh, project team lead and the uh, co-valibility. These kind of hierarchy uh, exist uh, in almost all open source projects. And this serves as a various position in OpenStack now. The, uh, we have uh, technical committee seat and serve as a PC chair. And uh, we have a project lead in uh, Horizon currently, and uh, previously uh, we serve the QA and Horizon details too. The also, uh, we have core reviewers in, in uh, Nova Neutron, the core OpenStack project, and the uh, NTACA NFB project, and the I also uh, serve as a Warriors in CLI part. Uh, also, the we have uh, PC chair members uh, recently recently was elected to individual direct board of directors. Uh, the main uh, reason to serve as a individual board is to connect the uh, uh, development side and the uh, foundation board. So the, what we are working on now, so the, uh, roughly speaking, uh, we have two, two areas. We, we are working on two areas. The one is the open stack wide improvements. I, uh, we consider the open stack is considered as a nature, so our focus is to improve open stack in general rather than specific features. So it is called uh, this kind of effort is called as community goal, and uh, technical committee picks themes uh, based on feedback from uh, users. As a leadership position like a PC or project lead, and uh, we lead these efforts. Uh, recent hot topics, uh, there are two hot topics in this area. One is uh, uh, consistent secure role-based access control. And the uh, second, another one is uh, release cadence adjustment. I will uh, cover them uh, in later slide. The other area, the, the other area is NFV. Uh, the TAC, different from other open stack project, TACA project uh, is specific to uh, NFV. NFV means uh, uh, network function virtualizations. The, the main goal is to make TACA a working reference implementation of NFV. So the, this effort is a joint effort with telecom carriers. The, uh, the article uh, uh, in the U, uh, the article has a, is URL uh, covered, uh, captured the uh, uh, recent activities uh, uh, with NTP and KGBI, and uh, it was, uh, it, the article was published uh, last year, but uh, we continue to improve uh, uh, TACA, improve TACA, but they are, in, as the NEC, uh, the, our focus is to improve uh, stability and address uh, feedbacks uh, from production use, including, uh, and uh, POC, POCs. In next, 
uh, two slides. Uh, the two slides. Uh, uh, I will cover the. I will talk about uh, community-wide goals. The first thing. Uh, the first thing is the consistent secure RBAC. The OpenStack API provides uh, the mechanism for role-based access control, uh, but uh, the current default policy is uh, very simple. Uh, we have only two roles, uh, system-wide admin and uh, tenant user. Um, if you'd like to have more granular needs, we need to uh, implement policies, configure policies uh, almost from scratch. Uh, this is a pain point from uh, operators. So the, in this effort, um, we would like to define uh, more well-defined uh, default policies. So the, in the, this effort uh, consists of uh, breakdown into several phases. And, uh, and now, the, uh, in the first step, uh, we introduce a uh, project leader. Uh, project that means uh, they cannot uh, create or delete uh, resources, and they can just read resources. And the project member can, can create and delete uh, resources. Uh, this guy, in the first step, uh, uh, these roles uh, uh, Revisited. The, in the second phase, uh, we uh, we uh, plan to split service to service APIs uh, from admin role, and uh, uh, we introduce a service role. And currently, the uh, service to service communication uh, uses admin role in most cases, uh, but uh, uh, service should not have such uh, powerful. Uh, Powerful privileges. So that, that's the second step. Uh, the last phase, uh, we are not sure we have more steps. Uh, uh, we will, we'd like to introduce a project level admin. Uh, they can create uh, users for uh, project or some. The next, the other topic is, uh, is release cadence adjustment. Currently, the OpenStack upgrade pass is uh, called uh, the fast forward upgrade. This means the upgrade should happen one by one, even uh, if we upgrade multiple release at a time. So this is a headache for a large scale crowd. Upgrade usually takes time, so they need to upgrade, 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 continue to <laughs> upgrade various nodes one by one. So the, this effort to mitigate, just mitigate to this situation, the, this is how to support uh, uh, upgrade from uh, two release before. The community plans to test this style of upgrade from the next release uh, as experimental. Uh, we, in the current plan, um, official support will start from uh, C release next uh, 2024. Uh, this release will, will would be would support uh, upgrade direct upgrade from A to C. Yeah, that's uh, uh, currently discussed uh, uh, current uh, community wide activities. The, that's all from me. The, the next speaker is Ken. Ken will talk about uh, the testing in open source project. Hi, everyone. I am Ken Ichiomichi from NEC, and I have worked in some open source projects like Linux kernel, OpenStack, and Kubernetes and to, to improve testing and debugging methods at those projects. Then today I'm going to discuss continuous testing in open source project. In many open source projects, continuous testing are running for keeping good quality of software or product. For example, when a contributor submits a pull request, uh, 
you need to te many tests like unique test, integration test, and the E3 tests are operated. If all tests are passed successfully, uh, the and the code review uh, looks good for the pull request. This pull request is going to be merged into upstream, like main branch or master branch. That is main working working flow. For if some tests are failed, uh, the contributor needs to investigate the root causes and solve the issue. Otherwise, uh, the pull request never gets ready. And uh, next, as my previous slide, we saw an overview of continuous testing in open source projects. Here we are going to see what kind of tests are running in Kubernetes as an example. As I said, basic tests are running like unit tests, integration tests, and E3 tests. In addition, we are operating coding style check, type check, document style check, CLA, contributor license agreement check, package names, naming rule check, or something. So each pre-request kicks uh, uh, 19 uh, test pattern, test type, and 45,000 tests uh, kicked automatically. Why so many tests and uh, checks are implemented and operated like this? As you know, so many contributors are working together in the world and in open, stack, open source project, and we all have a different background and different culture and so on. And actually, uh, the latest stable version of Kubernetes 1.25, which, uh, which is uh, completed uh, sorry, uh, four months development cycle, and uh, 1,700 uh, 1, contributors joined to the development. And it is, in this session, it is so difficult to uh, expect all contributors follow the development guideline. Instead of that, it is possible to make all contributors follow the development guideline and to keep a good quality at the scale to improve automated test and check. And that means we can keep uh, the scalability for open source development. And uh, unit tests and integration tests don't tend to depend on environment. It is enough or fine to run uh, those tests in a single environment at the CI system. On the other hand, E3 tests depend on environment because we need to deploy actual, depl uh, actual target, which is Kubernetes cluster in this case, and uh, we need to run the E3 tests against the deployed Kubernetes cluster. We need to select operating system, IPv4 or IPv4 and IPv6 dual stack, or uh, what is the container runtime, what is the CNI, we need to select those things. And from, so from the Kubernetes development, we need to continue running E3 tests for many different pattern of Kubernetes cluster. When I joined to the Kubernetes open, stack, open source project, I proposed test measuring tool, test coverage measuring tool. Kubernetes has an open API definition, specification, which is a op API definition and generated from the implementation code. And I propose a way to compare the open API specification and E3 test operation log to know which API is not tested during the E3 test. And, and I created some prototype based on this idea, and many people agreed with it. Then today we have a API snoop as a, a separated CNCF project. After this measuring tool, API coverage of E3 tests uh, improved from 70% 2017 to 71% today. 
as this graph. Uh, sorry, this is so simple. And open source software looks like common shared product in the world. We are imp uh, imp improving the product for many people. If some, uh, if some tests are also are good for many people, we can add those tests into the community. And we can run those tests with community asset. Uh, the community asset here means the credit, but some sponsoring organization donate to open source foundation like Linux Foundation, CNCF, Open Infra Foundation, and so on. By using those credit, uh, open source community can operate those continuous testing on the some cloud provider like Google Cloud for Kubernetes community. Uh, continuous test of open source project also should be good for many people. That should not for some specific people. Uh, if implementing continuous test only for some few specific people, we are wasting not only uh, the community asset, but also wasting devel important developer time to investi investigating an issue when the issue happened at the first. So we need to consider what kind of tests should be implemented in open source projects for many people. One good example is how about uh, implementing uh, test cases for hardening environments? I do, <laughs> I did. Uh, CIS and Center for Internet Security provides CIS benchmark for Kubernetes. Those benchmarks explain how to make Kubernetes cluster more secure with actual Kubernetes configuration. It is nice to have uh, uh, some tests based on this benchmark for many people. I create a pull request uh, right, uh, left side based on this idea. If we face some issue on your uh, hardening environment, it would be nice hint to investigate such issues by comparing community test environment configuration and your environment. And oh, oh sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Next. Uh, Nuto-san will explain Kubernetes dashboard and the Kubernetes upstream frame in Japan. Hi, I'm Shu Nuto. I'm contributing to uh, Kubernetes dashboard and work as a one node maintainer and CDI chair. We are contributing to dashboard to optimize customize, uh, customer's Kubernetes user experience. So now I'd like to show you introduction and plans for future uh, next version of uh, dashboard as a maintainer. Kubernetes dashboard is a general purpose web UI for Kubernetes clusters. It allows users to manage clusters and applications running uh, in the clusters and troubleshoot them. The current version is 2.7 and it supported uh, Kubernetes 1.25. Kubernetes dashboard has components for uh, front-end UI and back-end API. Uh, the front-end uh, UI works as a single uh, page application and back-end API interacts with Cube API server, Hipster, and the other third-party components. Now, uh, Kubernetes dashboard is packaged in one binary until the latest release. We split that uh, front-end UI and back-end API into each container. And the splitting was done in uh, master branch. We have plan for uh, further improvements, uh, setting up uh, the API gateway that supports GraphQL. This uh, migrating parts of the old APIs into separated uh, microservices these improvements will allow to optimize to uh, scale each API and migrating current development pipeline to support the new architecture. We also have plan to improve the authorization layer uh, that will include supporting OpenID Connect 
improving the authorization handling and setting up the microservices for the authorization. We presented that this roadmap in KubeCon, Europe in May, uh, and the current status is here. Not only to use, uh, also to keep the Kubernetes and OSS supply chain sustainable, uh, we have to also contribute to community growth. So we are running the Kubernetes upstream training in Japan for who want to get involved into Kubernetes community. Here, uh, we have to mention the reasons that prevent Japanese developers from joining community. First is language barrier. Uh, compared with Western people, Eastern people, such as Japanese, are actually not too used to speaking English. However, it seems like everyone in the community communicates in English, and mastering English is the only way to better integrate into the community. Second, cultural barrier. In community, everyone is expected to speak up actively, brainstorm together, and draw conclusions through this whole communication process. However, Japanese people tend to speak, uh, tend to think a lot before they speak, and therefore miss the opportunity to state their opinion. And this makes them to think more and become more and more afraid to speak up. We are aiming to lower these barriers. These are what we tell uh, the trainees in our training. We want to encourage more and more people to get involved in the community. Uh, for those who are interested but don't know where to start, uh, our training offers an opportunity to walk them throughout the whole process of making contribution. And at the end of the day, uh, most of them will go home with their very first pull request. We also want them to make friends and solve problems related to Kubernetes in Japan. So we added few channels for uh, Japanese conversations. And the most important part is what one uh, we want to deliver the following message. Even if you are not fluent in English, you can say anything. Uh, everyone in community is very kind, so don't be afraid to start. We are running the upstream training eight times since uh, 2019, and we got about 160 contributors. We held our training in these public events. I'd like to thank the organizers of these events for inviting us. Our training contents are based on the Kubernetes new contributor workshop that provided by Kubernetes com community. We reorganized this original content for Japanese. These are improvements uh, that we did to motivate trainees. We asked the trainees to express their enthusiasm in advance on the Kubernetes Slack channel in Japanese. It would be the first step to join Kubernetes community. To address a request of the survey for our training, uh, we added introductions to the actual development environment like CubeSpray, website, and dashboard. Uh, which is the activity area of our trainers. We took photos after the training and made it public so that they can aware of that they became a member of the community. For about a week after the training, uh, our follow-up is carried out until the trainees uh, pull requests are merged. Also, we made video and published it to YouTube, then created the space for self-training, and we reviewed their pull request too. Back in 2020, uh, the situation is so bad that we can't leave home, so we had no choice but to hold our events 
online. So we improved in everything we could think of. Uh, in that time, we could only prepare Zoom meeting. Uh, now, we can use webinar and breakout rooms too, but they are needed, taking a few extra steps to share discussions, questions, and answers. Uh, so we continue to use the basic meeting style. And we make all of training uh, resources available for trainees preparation. Since it was forced to be held online, so we considered pros and cons before running the online training. These pros have made our training easier to organize and the diversity of trainees are getting wider. <coughs> our trainees include students uh, with limited travel funds, people who doesn't have quiet room and participated from his car, and people raising children and people who are not strong in physical. On the other hand, uh, there was a concern about that intimate support uh, like one-on-one -on -one would be difficult. We can look at the trainees' computers and tell them what to do next uh, we used to do. We saw that uh, communication is not as convenient as before through the screen. But in fact, uh, lots of the trainees were able to submit their pull requests in online training. Uh, its percentage was significantly higher than in person. Rather, sharing with everyone on Slack or Zoom and learning how to solve problems remotely, that matched the community manner. So concern about difficulty of one-on-one -on -one was an unfounded fear. Many useful online tools help sharing everything with everyone, each other, instantly. And we found that online training is more practical for actual contribution. But sometimes we want to meet people in person. In a non-English native country, Motivating, encouragement, and support in the local language can be great help in getting started. Uh, online training is more practical for contribution, on, so online training has already, already become a default. It is important to train in the environment like GitHub or Slack that actually used in the Kubernetes community and make them feel like uh, they are already part of the community. It is effective to uh, publish all training resources in the open source manner. Our next training will be held at Okinawa Open Days 2022 on December 14th. This training will be held as hybrid. Uh, it's a new challenge for us. Uh, this crowd, a uh, colleague, will run this uh, training. And big shout out to excellent uh, engineer Akihito and very promising member CE. Thank you for your uh, great contribution to this uh, training. Thank you everyone for coming to our session at last. Uh, thank you to all of open source projects that are made by thanks, respect, and collaboration. That's all from us. Thank you.